Good morning. How are you? Good morning. I am Kristen Jordan Fodder. I'm the director of the consultant team here at Bright Idea, and I've been here for about four years. Um, it's been really great experience to start off as a consultant and grow into this role to manage the team. And I've had an opportunity to work with some amazing clients, some of you in the room. So I'm glad to be able to spend a little bit of time with you today to talk about one of our most exciting new apps. And I want to start off by just asking, is everybody comfortable? Yes. I'm you can comfortable. feel free. <laughs> Feel free to, you know, take your jacket off. Okay, good. I don't see anybody with a tie on, which is fantastic, because we're not a tie sort of a group here. Um, you know, I just want you to know you can be yourself. You know, this is, this is a place where you can be you, and if that means you're feeling a little bit crazy, you've got a lot of energy, you've got, you know, a lot of ideas to throw out, this is the place to do that, because you are here in the nest. This is a safe place. And, now that you all know this is a safe place, it's important to know that today we're not going to be talking about the um, normal sort of eggs that you might see in a regular nest. This isn't your sort of everyday waterfowl or chicken that you are encountering on a traditional farm. This is, we're talking about um, eggs of a different sort of nature. I'm going to go a little bit old school just for our reference point here. Um, just to give you guys a little bit of reference here, so, so these, these are eggs that are hatching into things that your companies might not be quite comfortable with embracing, creating products and services that don't exist yet. And that's why you need an environment for these precious moonshot ideas that a lot of people are, think, are gonna think are completely insane, don't fit within your business model, aren't really what your company does. Um, this, is, uh, this isn't business as usual. So um, every day in your company there are discussions around um, optimizing profits and managing expectations and black belt Six Sigma optimizations and all those sorts of things. And it's important for you to have a place where those ideas can escape those pressures and rigors of, of everyday um, business life. Because when there's a kernel of an idea for a new product or service, there's not much that will kill it faster than those sorts of business as usual expectations. And that's why we created um, Incubate. This is, uh, every department in your organization should be growing, should be developing, should be reinventing themselves. Um, nobody has a pass on innovation. And this pipeline is another tool in your toolbox of innovation resources to offer your organizations. This is something that, um, <clears throat> The business, unit in, the business units in your um, company, this is a place where they can deposit their moonshot ideas and have confidence that we've built a safe place, a positive environment where those uh, concepts can be nurtured and grown in the appropriate sort of way. Whoops, sorry about that. Um, let's see, so what we're gonna talk about is the why, when, who, where, and how of Incubate. So first let's talk about why Incubate should be part of your toolkit. Without a centralized pipeline for a BU or a department, it's likely that innovation is occurring in isolated pockets in different places. Um, people aren't necessarily talking to one another. Um, they're not understanding that um, someone might be doing something similar to them in another place. And one of the repercussions um, of this is duplication. There may be a group of people who are trying to pursue an opportunity that another group has um, already researched and tested and ruled out or even launched. And either way, you've got wasted resources um, because of this lack of shared knowledge. And with this isolation, there might be worthwhile projects stalling out also because you've got um, uh, 
projects that don't necessarily have the support or funding um, available to them because they don't know that there is this central um, operation or team or resources available. And there's a gem of a project that might not ever make it to the surface. So this gives you the opportunity to bring these things together and um, benefit from this optimization. <clears throat> we call these risky projects because moving them forward to fruition is really difficult, and a lot of you in this room already know that. It's a challenge to acquire the resources and support to nurture these through those necessary preparatory stages. And these are concepts that require time to explore and test and understanding that the business can't place the same expectations on these concepts um, as they do their existing suite of services. So these are the sorts of exploratory experiments that many people within your company will raise their eyebrows about and question what sort of value this brings to the business. Uh, I worked at Humana in their innovation center for four years, and there was this sentiment that um, other people were working to pay our salaries, and that we were on this crazy kooky floor, and all we did was play with robots and artificial intelligence. And no one really was sure that we were actually deriving any financial benefit to the company. So having a disciplined process like this allows you to demonstrate um, that you are providing value to the process. George, can I borrow you for a quick second? Um, just on here. I'm trying to move this down. I'm trying to move this down. I'm not sure how to actually get to that point. So, and that's my alarm to take my medicine. <laughs> yeah. Technical difficulties. There's a PowerPoint whiz in here. PowerPoint? Or display PC. wizard? Because I got the Mac. Come here. <laughs> How many innovation consultants does it take to get the light bulb? Three. <laughs> so, while we work this out, <clears throat> the other reason why you want to bring this into your organization is that it gives you this um, significant benefit of transparency. Because Incubate exists as a core pipeline, this allows the business owner, hmm? That's it, it's the touchpad. It allows the business owner to have the full perspective of where his or her roadmap is going. Um, we're looking at Horizon 2 and Horizon 3 projects here, so it's important to be able to see what's coming down the pike. And um, this allows that business unit owner to make adjustments and make sure that they are tapping into the necessary resources and funding um, along the way. And at a detailed level, it's really important to be able to see where things are in the pipeline. Um, are there quite a few projects that are sitting in the research phase? Do you have a whole bunch of projects here um, in launch preparation that haven't gone to commercialization? It allows that owner to make sure that there's a nice significant balance and that you've got things moving forward in the Horizon 2 area, but that you've also got things cooking in Horizon 3. And from a, from a process standpoint as well, this allows, our, our software allows that business unit owner and also the incubation pipeline manager to look very, very detailed into each project and take a look and see, is anything stalling somewhere? Ha, do we have a project that's been sitting in a prototype stage for three months and not moving forward? Um, you guys are all pretty, pretty well familiar with our software, so you know the benefit of things like action items, status tracking, notifications, leveraging the rules engine, all those sorts of things give significant visibility into whether or not things are moving forward as they should be and meeting the deadlines that you've outlined. And then also, um, just from a transparency perspective, being able to do things like record outcomes, which Genevieve talked about yesterday, you can not only record outcomes of different types, but you can also record outcomes in the different currencies, which is really exciting for us to be able to offer. So that also it offers you an additional benefit of transparency in being able to share these financial outcomes with your key stakeholders and leaders. And as you know, providing outcomes and things like that um, provides uh, builds trust with your stakeholders 
and that trust leads to more and future support for your program. All right, we're winging it. Yes. That's what we do. So the when component here is, is really addressing when this should become part of your innovation journey. And um, many of you have probably seen our innovation maturity model. This is a, a new version that we have just come out with and it addresses um, all of the nine apps that we have released that we talked about yesterday. Um, right now we are gonna talk a little bit about start and a little bit ex about expand. And we're not gonna go to scale quite yet because um, at this part of your innovation journey, we suggest that you're, you're beginning here and moving into to this stage. So the, the maturity model really gives you a framework a framework to establish how you should grow into your innovation program in terms of how you should be leveraging the apps that we are offering to you, as well as giving you some direction on what sort of KPIs and key attributes you should be focusing on and incorporating into your program and your best practice efforts within your organization. We suggest that people begin here within the start phase. It doesn't always work out that way. Many of you have come to us and said, you know what, we have our own incubation process and this is where we wanna begin. And so we might um, talk with you then about you know, the benefits of incorporating some of these other components. Um, but at its general recommendation, we suggest that you begin here within the start phase and leverage the apps that George was just talking about in his last session, which include discuss and optimize and solve. And the reason why we do this is it gives you an opportunity to build out your capability of innovation as a shared service, which is essentially around the core concept that the innovation team is there to help facilitate innovation across the organization. These sorts of forums and challenges give people within your business an opportunity to tackle problems that are approachable um, and it also gives you guys a chance to demonstrate that your teams are hitting the low-hanging fruit in your organizations. These challenge topics should be focused on things that are known problems within your organization and great opportunities for optimizations within different business areas. So with these being sort of more straightforward targeted challenges, the idea is that you can develop ideas and actually put them into the implementation process and generate some outcomes fairly quickly. What that does, and you're gonna hear me say this a couple more times, is being able to demonstrate value quickly gives you an opportunity to share those financial value um, metrics with key stakeholders and leadership. That leadership starts to understand, hey, you're actually giving me some financial benefit, so I'm gonna trust you to do more. So establishing this first driving engagement within your organization, within everybody across the business, gives you a little bit of runway to now move into some different things within this expand phase that might require more investment, that might have a longer lead time. And so that's where Incubate lies, is right here within our expand phase. Um, you'll also see that Incubate is accompanied by Pitch and Hack, which I'll be talking a little bit about as well. Um, and I know Chris and Alex did a fantastic job talking about Hack in your last session here in this room as well. So hopefully some of you guys had a chance to hear about that. So this is Hack, and this is Incubate, and this is Pitch. Okay. <clears throat> Now let's talk a little bit about who within the organization really plays a key role in managing this in your organization. Um, building on our discussion around the maturity model, um, we suggest that you maintain that approach of innovation as a shared service, meaning that you as an innovation team um, offer Incubate as a part of your suite of services to the rest of the organization. Um, that being said, one common variant is there may be a, an internal funded labs group within your organization, which means that you have a group of individuals who have their own funding, they have their own mandate, and they within their own sort of closed group are executing on innovation activities in and of themselves. They're not um, bringing in other parts of the business or they're not funded by somebody else. Um, we suggest that you begin here 
because it really gives you sort of an approachable way to bring this in to what you do as an innovation team. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we feel that every business unit or department should be innovating. They should be reinventing themselves. They should be looking for opportunities to bring new tech into what they do. And so the suggestion here is that you connect with a business unit leader or a departmental unit leader, somebody per perhaps within the IT group, and connect with them and say, look, we as an innovation team, we're here to um, offer this incubate pipeline to you and help support you in these efforts. But some of the key attributes around that approach include that business unit leader is going to be the individual who will provide the funding. That's a key thing to be aware of is that um, that person's going to be supporting that financially as well as they're going to be providing resources in terms of the people who will be executing on those projects. And I'll talk a little bit more about those key roles and the defining factors around those. And then the innovation team here is to offer some supporting services which I'll get into in a second as well. So now you're at a point where hopefully you've connected with a business unit leader who has established a desire for this. They've got the right resources in place. There's a commitment there to continue to support this from a human perspective and a financial perspective. And we can talk about who the key players are to be a part of that. First, you've got your sponsor. As I mentioned, this would be a senior leader. It might be the head of a business unit. It could be a head of a product line. It might be the head of a functional group. Um, but this person provides the budget and the resources. And if I work with you directly as a client, I always tell you there are some absolute mandatories when you're working with sponsors, and those mandatories shift a little bit from use case to use case. Um, but that commitment to find resources is absolutely critical. Dramatic pause. <laughs> if they don't have those resources, then it's not the right time for them to engage in this particular activity. It's something that as an innovation team member, you can continue to educate them on and continue to support them on and hopefully point them in that general direction. Um, but it's not the right time to engage in them. And that's a general best practice for an innovation team is whenever you're working with someone in the business unit, there's an overall concept of shared responsibility. And if the other person, your partner within that business unit isn't willing to step up and commit to their um, aspect of that shared responsibility, it's not the right time for you to be working with them. They need to do what they need to do to get those resources in place first. Next, this is a hugely critical role, the incubate manager. We call this out separately from the incubate sponsor because likely the sponsor is going to be at a leadership level, which means they're not really going to have the time to be really hands-on with what's happening and moving through the pipeline. So the incubate manager is the person that's actually going to be focusing on what's coming into the pipeline and making sure that it's moving through the pipeline and that it's not sitting somewhere. Um, there are a lot of key tactical items that that person's going to be following up on. They're going to be connecting with the human resources, the people that are going to be involved in um, building out the projects, and checking on things like deadlines, making sure that people have um, the information that they need. They might also be um, connectors. Because oftentimes when you're talking about new products or services, you don't just need people within the product line. You might need somebody from finance. You might need somebody from marketing. You might need somebody from market research. So the incubate manager can be one of those critical people to make those connection points between different parts in the organization. All right, these are your doers, your incubate team members. These can be people that come from within the business unit, or as you mentioned, they might come from a functional area. And bless you. One of the key aspects of running a program like this is making sure that the individuals who are working with these people are comfortable with their participation in this project. And that needs to be um, both a a spoken commitment and an actual commitment, because sometimes you'll work with people in the business and they'll sort of begrudgingly say, sure, you can borrow my resource, but they're not really happy about it. So we want to make sure that the people who are participating in these projects, um, A, understand that they're participating in a fantastic, awesome, really cool project, but that they're also supported by their management team 
and that their managers and directors understand that they're contributing in a really meaningful way to what could be the future direction of the business. So these are some really important people and they obviously are going to bring different talents and different levels of expertise. You want people who understand um, design aspects of projects, people who understand what customer need is, who the customers are, what their profiles look like, the language that they speak, demographics, psychographics. But then you also need, of course, um, the functional aspects of this, people that can code, people that can do UX design, people who um, can design new, new services within the organization. So. These are important people. Now let's talk a little bit about what the innovation team does here. There really are sort of varying levels of support that the innovation team can offer the business unit partner in this particular aspect. <clears throat> They are certainly going to support them from a software aspect. Um, in most cases, the innovation team will be the people that would set up the pipeline, make sure that the right people are, are put in the right places. Um, there likely might be some cross-training as well from the innovation team over to the incubate manager so they understand how to do the, the drag and drop of projects, moving from step to step, recording outcomes, things like that, um, assigning deadlines, and, and manipulating the tools within that pipeline area. Um, they might also, depending on the resources within the team and depending on the resources within the business unit, they may offer some expertise in the lean startup methodologies that we're leveraging here within this approach. So they might help that team understand how to effectively put together a business model canvas or how to ensure that the prototype is built to an appropriate level or what an MVP really means and how to get there, what a riskiest assumption is, et cetera. So there's sort of... Um, um, a symbiotic relationship here. And again, it's going to depend on what your organization looks like, how many resources you have within that innovation team, and what the business unit looks like and their capabilities. Because there can be vastly different experiences. For example, if you're working with a product team who is very used to developing new products and services, they probably have a lot of these capabilities already, versus maybe working with something, somebody like an HR team. It's not their bread and butter to be working on things like this. So just something to keep in mind and to consider. Now the where, we've talked a lot internally about where this pipeline should live within your organization. And we've had some different debates and, and what we've come to with Incubate in general, as I, I've mentioned a couple times already, there are some different variants of how this can, how this can um, be, be managed within your organization and where it might live. So as I mentioned earlier, we're suggesting the innovation as a shared service approach, which means we're suggesting that the location for the pipeline be within a business unit. So that gives that business unit an opportunity to really focus on their core riskiest projects, their very specific needs, um, and their desires to pursue um, these new projects and services or incorporating tech into what they do. Um, now, another option is certainly to have a pipeline that spans the entire organization. Um, I, I know that some organizations are approaching it that way. Um, and there are some pros and cons, of course, to both ways to do it. But we feel like for introducing Incubate into your organization, it's going to be easier to do it this way. It allows you to start small to establish core best practices around how to manage and support this, um, to get some core things out on paper, to establish some wins, and then be able to grow and expand. But still, it's a shared service, correct? Exactly. A shared service starting off. A shared service starting off within a silo. Is that is that the is that is that one approach? So the shared service model really looks at basically the innovation team is here, and then they are supporting the incubation activities within a specific business unit. So it is looking at starting small within that core team. And then the other benefit to, of course, leveraging the software is everything's on one platform. So there is an opportunity to look at things more holistically, but we are suggesting you know, starting small. And another reason why we are suggesting that approach is in your larger, more decentralized organizations, it's more realistic to have different pipelines and different functional units. For example, GE Aviation is almost a business in and of itself. So it makes sense for them to have their own pipeline versus having an entire you know, GE pipeline. All right. 
Now let's talk a little bit about where projects come from for an incubate effort. We suggest that you look at sourcing projects um, directly from the manager um, or uh, leveraging the manager or the sponsor's discretion here and that they are basically hand selecting those projects to ensure that they really are appropriate for this incubation pipeline, that they've checked the boxes, that these are truly risky projects. These are new products, these are new services, this is a technology that nobody's embraced, we might be talking about a new business model, um, but essentially making sure that this isn't maybe an optimization of an existing process, things that the company already knows how to do well and that you really don't need to be applying this level of resources towards. I know there are some organizations that I'm working with now who are approaching it more from an open standpoint and they have these pipelines completely open to their entire community at any time. So that's something to consider. Some of those key factors I think that weigh into that decision are um, how comfortable is your organization with innovation? How educated are there? I know a lot of people that we work with feel like their company really hasn't engaged and sort of bought into the concept of innovation. They might be very risk averse. They might be in an environment where um, things are measured very closely and decisions are made based on very fine nuanced decisions. So there can be some fear in terms of putting ideas that might be a little bit crazy or moonshot ideas um, out there to the public for everyone to see. Now, <clears throat> Oh, yeah. So would the second um, bullet there, would that be leveraging the discuss model where you open it up to everybody and then <coughs> picking from there something that you would then choose to incubate? You know, discuss is a great entry point into building engagement within the company. We look at that as more of a dialogue, but it can be an interesting point to see what is our company talking about? What do people feel like is an interesting um, opportunity perhaps? So maybe it could lend itself well to a potential direction for some of these activities in, this, in the expand phase if you find that people are really excited and interested in um, bringing in AI or such. Just one thing to add there because we were just in the previous. I, I want to just highlight specifically with Discuss, you always got to remember the goal of Discuss and the positioning of Discuss, especially when you're, when you're facing a very broad audience, you've got to be real careful not to let anyone think that these are ideas, these are moving to implementation, these are something that mm -hmm. is meant to be, you know, with, with the budget analysis or anything. Discuss yeah. is purely a conversation. Now, mm -hmm. what you guys as a core team might see in the data that you'll be getting out of people talking is separate, and maybe you can do something with that, that new intelligence, but the end users, your employee base, should never be considering we just we plugged in a new forum. I'm seeing the, the you know the same color, the branding. So that's that's the disgusting that we did before with the CEO. Well, I have this idea, so I'm going to plug it in there because that that's exactly what you don't want. Disgust is purely conversation. There's no there's no button that says idea. You know, now when it comes to this, maybe down the line, as Kristen said, there's something to loop in through other means. But from disgust perspective, that should be make sure it's it's mutually exclusive. They are mutually exclusive. There is, I am gonna be talking about some other apps though that can be a feeder into this in just a second, which is when you're looking at hand selecting those projects, I think there are a few easy ways to start in terms of gathering what could go in your pipeline. So the first place is to look at what's currently happening, what new product development activities are happening at the moment. So if there's an existing project bring it into the fold, go ahead and put it into the pipeline. It's great because it gives you some immediate progress to talk about, some current activity and, and progress here. So that's the first step. The second step is to look within that business unit and identify is there an existing R&D group that's already doing that. Again, if you're working with a product line, it's likely that they already have a team of people who are looking to see what's next, what should they be doing next. So that would be a great group to talk to. And then also anybody that's doing voice of the customer or marketing. Uh, I know a good friend of mine worked at Yum, and they had marketing teams within each of their product groups that were consistently looking at what new products should be brought into the different stores that they were operating. So those are great places to look to, to see what opportunities you can pull into your incubate pipeline. And then the last one's really exciting, which is to say you can also leverage the other apps within the expand phase, which include pitch and hack. 
Um, as I mentioned, Alex and, and um, Chris talked a little bit about Hack, but for those of you that weren't in that session, as a reminder, that's essentially your hackathon. And what you might find that surfaces out of some of those efforts is that you've great, got some, some really great early prototypes. So maybe um, a nod towards what could be an MVP that could be folded into your incubate process. So that could be a great feeder. And then also pitch um, is, a, is a really nice sort of plug in here because with Pitch, you're working with people within your company to develop those core business cases. That's exactly what Pitch is designed to do and find out if people within the company are interested in that. So there might be some promising things that come out of um, Pitch events that you can bring into the Incubate fold and then further support the development of. Would it be a separate challenge for the Incubate? So your Pitch would be a separate initiative and then this would be all open Exactly. So within the software, they would be distinct environments. You would have your pitch event, and you could leverage the pitch event app or the hack event app. And so those activities would occur within that particular web storm from a software perspective. And then after decisions were made, the incubate manager or incubate sponsor might connect with the hack sponsor or pitch sponsor and say, you know what? These look really great. It's interesting. You, you know, you've established some interest here. You've established an interest in funding these. We've got an established go-to-market process. So let us help you now take this from this point where you've got a, um, a, a fairly established business model or business case, and let us leverage this lean startup methodology to then take that to fruition to commercialization. The framing of the incubate is it for things that you're not sure about, you want to use a lean startup, you try a bit of you know, testing. Exactly. So it's exactly. particularly geared to that. Yes, yep, and we're going to get right into that within the next section, so that's a good segue. So next is the how. Um, how do you set up a pipeline? How does the incubate process set you up for success, which is getting to some of your questions? How can you ensure your resources are focused on the most important elements? And then how can you report on successes and failures? Because Incubate isn't like everything else that you're doing it within your innovation journey. It's, it's a different animal. So first, let's talk about how you set up a pipeline. I love these new pages. I think these are awesome. Genevieve talked about our app detail pages. And I am super proud of our product team and everybody that worked on all the resources that are in this. Anthony put a ton of work into the playbooks that you're going to see here. We've got configuration guides. Every single app has this detail page that tells you when to use it, how to use it, timeline guides, it's so fantastic. So check these out on all your apps. But with Incubate, we've obviously got the same thing here. So this is your first landing place. Then all you have to do is click this lovely green button to set up your Incubate process. You're gonna go through these wizard screens. As I, I'm gonna pause here and just mention that from a human perspective, what you're gonna be doing here is the innovation team would be sitting down with the Incubate sponsor or with the Incubate manager to help define this sort of content because it's really that business unit's interest to communicate to people what it is that they're trying to accomplish. Is there a specific desire to focus solely on developing new products? Are they interested more in incorporating tech? Do they wanna make it more broad? But this is the place to describe what it is that you want to accomplish and, and the process that, that we've outlined here. So this is step one of the wizard. This is step two of the wizard. And then if you notice here, create process. So that's it. Easy peasy. Now you have your pipeline, which is amazing. <laughs> um, so next is talking about how does the incubate process set you up for success? And this is where most of my notes are inaccessible to me. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we're doing more ad libbing here. Um, <clears throat> this process is fantastic because it is defined and it's structured. As I mentioned before, most people's roles within their companies are to um, to uh, provide cost cutting measures, to um, optimize the um, manufacturing times of things, to expand market opportunities. Um, there's often not really established best practices for how to effectively go through and, and, and develop and nurture those Horizon 2 and Horizon 3 projects. 
Um, so in order for the pipeline to yield these projects successfully, there's a certain amount of rigor that has to be in, encompassed, um, embraced, that's the word I'm looking for, in order for this to be successful. And that's why we did lean on those lean startup methodologies. And some of the key points here are on um, following up on those deadlines, having those action items to ensure that things are moving forward, um, ensuring that you are looking at projects and moving projects forward from step to step using the, the nice, clean, drag and drop approach here. Um, but this process is really, um, it's defined so that people can fail fast. Because your resources are, are your people, your, your, your brains and your company are the most precious resource that you have to leverage and the, the time. You only have eight or in some companies nine or 10 hours per day to be leveraging these people. So you wanna be making sure that they're working on the absolute most promising project that you've got within this pipeline. And so leveraging the process and, um, and staying close to those commitments and following through, that's what's gonna make this effective. So it's the discipline in following through on this. Now, <clears throat> in terms of managing the pipeline, these are two of the most important things that I can communicate to you about this. And the first is the concept of the riskiest assumption. Um, anybody at Bright Idea knows of um, our CEO's fondness of talking about Elon Musk and um, the efforts that he's, he's doing. And, and the story that he told recently was about how um, in his, I think it was this last interview that he did a couple weeks ago, he talked about um, how they identified what the most difficult part of this project was and the, the follow through on that sentence is, so we did that first. That became the most important aspect of the project, is they identified what the, the biggest obstacle was, the, what the most difficult thing was, the largest blocker to success, and that's where they focused their energies. So that's what we feel like is the, the core kernel of all of this, is identifying those riskiest assumptions um, moving those forward, identifying those hypotheses, testing them, really focusing on the things that you don't know how to do well. Um, and actually, it was great. In um, Kevin Kelly's presentation, he said the same thing. He was talking about the articles and how he was throwing out the ideas for, for different articles. And when someone adopted it and said, yes, I'll do it, he said, okay, great, that means that I don't need to do that. I can focus on something else. And so that was a big connection point for me here. It's really the same sort of concept. Let's bring the microphone over, Nikitas, so you can be on our recording. I just wanted to make a quick comment that that's, it's counterintuitive and it's also against human nature to, to, to do that. We mm -hmm. tend to, to, to look at where the sort of the easy wins are and then leave the sort of the hardest for last. But what you're suggesting is that actually kind of go against that urge and, and tackle the hardest ones first. Yep, exactly. <clears throat> I think that's it's, well. I think that's part of it. I think you know there are various steps that are incorporated in it, um, and that's certainly a part of it. And I think one thing that's really nice about our pipeline is that we're providing this structure and this framework, but we're also giving you an opportunity to customize it with the specific needs or the specific criteria that are important to you, which is of course going to vary from company to company, industry to industry. So there's certainly an opportunity to leverage what you feel like is most important and the key questions that you need to be asking about your efforts. Now, the other thing here is your pipeline is a funnel. Make sure the funnel is a funnel and not a cylinder, <laughs> okay? Because if it's a cylinder, it means you're not doing your job or your business unit leader is not doing their job. And when, when I was reviewing this presentation, Matt, um, talked about the, um, the, the fantastic impactful visual of um, you're gonna have to drown some puppies. <laughs> you're gonna have to do the hard thing of looking at all these really fun, cool, sexy, awesome, interesting projects, and you're gonna have to shut most of them down. And that's the reality of this sort of um, approach is you're looking at projects that haven't even emerged, they haven't really been defined yet and you're seeing where there is significant opportunity, what's really truly viable, what you can move, move forward, and then you're cutting off the ones that haven't 
checked those boxes. And that's absolutely critical because if you, if you don't, your resources are gonna be sucked dry. And you're also not actually gonna benefit from failure. And that's what I'm getting to in my very next slide is um, failure is one of the biggest successes of Incubate. So, um, George, you wanna scoot over there? So that's, that's one of the most important things. Here. So just on that question, yeah. so would you then reserve your funding to maybe the latter part and maybe get people to sort of do a quick experiment first without much funding and only if they pass, give them some funding? Because the funding is a scarce resource. Sure. I think your funding has to be appropriately spread out. So I think that when you're going through and pursuing an opportunity like this, you have to be able to fund all those stages. So it's certainly reasonable to say, if you're only in the research phase, we're gonna allocate $10,000 or $50,000 to you. We're not gonna give you $1 million right off the bat because you haven't really established that there's a true need for this. You haven't established the, the customer value or a, an established market. So I think it certainly makes sense to slowly allocate and um, determine when's the right time to continue to fund that and move that forward. Is there another question? Yeah, no, no, that's okay. Thank you. So you mentioned earlier that obviously as a business unit, you look to bring in-flight projects in and look mm -hmm. at R&D functions and teams that are in there. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously in the context of filtering some of those, I'm not gonna use the puppy analogy. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> Um, do you recommend that obviously you try and obviously just create one pipeline or would you recommend multiple pipelines? Just what's, what's the process for dealing with some of those that are already in flight? Well, I think when you're first getting started, it makes sense to start with one pipeline just because you're introducing a new process, you're introducing a new technology, um, and also the innovation team is sort of establishing this from the outset. So it's sort of like, let's start small, let's walk before we run, and let's figure out how to do this internally, let's establish some muscle memory. I think later on down the road, maybe a year into it, if there's a determination that this pipeline is so full, and what we're seeing is maybe there are some established themes here, and we potentially wanna break that out into multiple pipelines, that could be something down the road. I think it's really a strategic discussion for what's in the pipeline, how is it being leveraged, what's coming out. Is this actually an effective way or do you maybe feel like the pipeline is really sort of overloaded and it's gonna be easier to manage it if you split it out? I think it's really sort of a business discussion around what the mandate is, what's coming in, um, and is the process effective as is? And then determine if you need to make some adjustments there. Yeah, I, I was gonna mention, uh, my, my question is about the speed at which ideas flow there in projects. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously you have some very complex uh, projects that need a lot of prototyping and uh, iteration or whatever. Mm -hmm. It takes months or, or weeks Absolutely. Or, or years inside there. Yes. So ca how do you manage the different speeds at which different types of projects travel through that, that funnel? I mean, because you're, as, as an innovation manager, you want to push those things as fast as possible and also discard as soon as possible the bad ideas. Exactly. So, I mean, how do you manage the speed issue? You, you know, decide, the, it, decide what is a fixed structure. Yeah, it's, it's a really great question. Um, it's something that we've wrestled with, and honestly, I'm not sure that we have the exact right answer for this. Uh, I think to start out, it's, it's a great idea to look at those stages and think about what's gonna be coming in and try to establish some general pra best practices for timing, but it might be that you actually have to have some unique timing from project to project, depending on what it is. Um, I think it's a really good or question. Could be, yeah. Yeah, yeah, but I. Even managing of packages because if they have different ideas with different time frames in mm -hmm. the same funnel, I, I sort of see that that could be very difficult to manage. Yeah, and I think that with something like this, it it might have to be a one-off decision. You might need to look at each project and say, what is this? What's the nature of this? Is, it a, is this just bringing in a new technology? Or are we talking about a completely new business model that could take five years to really nurture and, and move through? And, and 
yeah, I, I don't think we've figured out exactly what the answer is to that. I think Jesse's got a good comment. I just add one, one, one thing to that. Also remember, just take, because you mentioned fast track. If it's fast track, should it be here? Uh, if it's fast track, should, maybe the business should just take it and run with it quickly before spending resources that are supposed to be extremely valuable. And, you know, if it's not high risk, it's not going to probably be very high reward. So maybe try to keep this, if you, if you build this kind of structure, try to keep it for an environment that you know, whatever gets in here, the whole organization knows, if it works out, it's going to be big. If it doesn't, it doesn't matter. If it's, it works out, it's going to be big. I would say that, yeah. Well, that's the judgment call, and that's why we suggest that things get hand-selected, so that the appropriate projects are moving into the pipeline and that the resources are being applied appropriately. Um, so I, I think just to add here, um, efficiency and throughput time is a, a pretty business-as-usual type of mentality. Um, Google does this uh, exceptionally well in their what was formerly Google X. They're starting to, <coughs> excuse me, they're starting to restructure and rename things. But the mentality that Google has is fail as quickly as possible, which is obvious. But the way that they effectuate that is to incentivize failure. So basically, the the Kristen shared the like the the expected resources who you want. You need people who are experts in rapid prototyping. You need people who are experts in research and so on and so forth. Over time, they, they optimize, right? They're, they're the best people at that job to be doing that. So I think the, the projects undoubtedly are going to have varying time frames. I think the question is, can we optimize the time to failure, right? Like that's the key mentality here versus each gate individually, does that have a specific time frame that we're going to try and set standards around? Because I don't, I don't think that's possible. I think if you look at Google as an example, because everybody knows about it, the driverless cars project, it's a, you know, it's a five, 10, 15 year project, right? The project loon project, balloons uh, serving internet, you know, it's, it's, certainly very complex, but it's lower cost. It's easier for, for them to get off the ground. You cannot compare these things apples to apples, right, from a timing perspective. So. And that's actually a good segue here to my last slide, which is really around successes and failures. Um, how do you report on sex successes and failures here? This, this isn't like a solve challenge where you've got a four-week ideation period and you've got metrics that fall into this nice clean box of we had this many ideas and this many went through the scorecard and this many got implemented and then in about three months you have outcomes and you've got some, some financial metrics to report on. This is, this is a completely different beast. So you guys all probably know we always give our clients um, the advice that they need to be clear on the mandate and they need to be clear on the expectations of what's going to be coming out of this and the benefits. That should be clear from the innovation team. It should be clear with the business unit team. It should be clear with both leaders um, and establish what those KPIs are early on. Um, and the reason is exactly what we were just talking about. These are horizon two and three projects that are going to be baking for a long time. It could be months, it could be years. Um, and we're also going to have a lot of projects that won't make it to the end. And the important point here is to identify that those projects that don't make it to the end, that we call failures, they bring a ton of value to the organization. So in order to really derive benefit from everything that's moving through the pipeline, it's important to be tracking all of that data and also reporting back on it because anything that's considered a failure is, should be lending you some insights. It should be giving you information on um, what hypotheses were tested in the results, um, what sort of market research was done, what, do, what did we learn about our customer, what did we learn about people who are not our customers. All of those failures should be lending research and insights back to us. And so really the key thing that I want to wrap with is that with Incubate, there are no failures. Your failures are successes because everything is going to lend you data and provide you value in the end. You said earlier that you can feed the ID8, the ID8 section, like the crowdsourcing, mm -hmm. into this, and this might be a longer term. 
Yes. So they have this ancient relationship. Yes. Yeah, they can definitely be a feeder there. Is there a way to transfer them from the ideation phase to the implementation phase? Why not just recreate and use? No, from a software perspective, it's actually very easy. The question was, um, can you go quickly and easily from the ideation phase into the incubate pipeline? And the answer is, it's very easy. We've got to move to or copy to WebStorm um, feature within the software, and this is actually one of the reasons why we did that, because we acknowledged that there would be some ideation activities happening within other apps or other WebStorms that you might want to bring over into this pipeline. Um, so we have just a few more minutes. We've already had some good dialogue, but I'm happy to open this up and answer any other questions that you have. And obviously, we've got some great Bright Idea people in the room that have already been helping to answer questions, and I'm sure they'll be happy to jump in as well. One second. No, you're fine. I, th I think this is more than just terminology, but yeah. how do you, how does incubate differ that much from just doing our standard prototyping? Or are they one of the same? Uh, I think the way we are looking at it is that incubate includes prototyping. So prototyping would be one step within it. Um, because beyond prototyping, in order to take something to market, you need to understand the finances behind it. There needs to be a monetization strategy. There needs to be a business case behind it. Um, you need to understand what your potential customer is. So I think prototyping is here, but you've got stuff that happens before prototyping, and then there's stuff that happens after prototyping that is important to the entire process of successfully going to market with something. So this is pretty much standard process here for any disruptive change to operations, correct? You would certainly prototype, prove the concept, but build the business case, right. iterate, exactly. uh, and, and, and then eventually launch if it's, if it's compelling. Mm-hmm, yeah. Yeah, I was wondering how much of the uh, how much is within the tool itself in terms of, for example, maybe we need to go test a hypothesis and go talk to 50 potential customers. Is it the tool going to have a way to capture all those discussions and the data and everything around that? Or does it have templates for those customer engagements? Yeah, it's interesting. I was talking to Laura about this earlier. And I think there are varying opportunities for how you can capture that. Um, what you're talking about immediately makes me think of our Understand app, which is the front end sort of component to design thinking, which is really designed to capture those customer feedback sessions and capture insights and things. So I think the, the questions that you have are dependent on what exactly you're doing. We never promise that Bright Idea can solve all problems and can accomplish everything that you need to within your innovation program. Um, so it may be that in certain instances, yes, it makes a lot of sense. In other instances, it may be better to use another tool and you know, perform those experiments or do that market research or something, and then bring the information in and import it and attach it to those development questions so you're capturing the data in there. I think it's really it's a difficult discussion to say specifically because I think it depends on what it is exactly that you want to do. The development know, questions. External resources, capture that, mm -hmm. um, et cetera. So you can use several of the tools in the different steps in the incubate process to being, you know, capture a lot of different types of data. And there are some, some templates um, you know, for each of the steps as what kind of data you would recommend you gather. Thank you. Could you still take that so that it's <laughs> Thanks, Chris. It, then then uh, you can take the, the results of your discuss question in app and transfer it into the uh, the incubate so that it's all exactly. captured and under the same are, project? There are obviously are separate apps, so I'm trying to keep keep the framework around the incubate process and the incubate app. But there might be points in the incubate you know, process that you're incubating an idea that you want to launch a discuss, right? Or you want to launch some other app to overcome a hurdle that you're facing while you're incubating an idea, get additional feedback, et cetera. But even within the incubate pipeline, the, the, in the steps, there are different tools that will, you know, allow you to go gather more data, you know, around the around the idea you're incubating, you know, without going and using other apps. You can, you can yep. 
just want to add one more clarification because those first three are my, 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 my bread and butter. So discuss again, in, in the case of Incubate, you would almost certainly not be launching a discuss. Maybe you're thinking something along, you know, Chris and mentioned understand where you have a, a large input of research. Maybe as a, an outshoot of the incubate process, maybe you'd need to tap into a specialized engineering group for, for a solve challenge. But as an entry point for new information, discuss would be far too much information and too, too broad. So what you're doing in, 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 in incubate would, would there'd be enough structure and enough, you know, risk assumptions, you know, you'd, you'd know enough that you wouldn't need to go huge to the whole company. Maybe solve, oh, yeah, uh, maybe understand as an entry. Yeah, can still transfer that information that Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah, the yeah. shift of information In is of up to, to you and utilization of the tool. Yeah, the nice thing about the pipeline tools is that there are multiple ways that you can bring in data. You can leverage what we call development que questions, which is essentially a repository for those project team members to fill out information directly within um, the app or the software itself. You can also attach everything from a diagram to um, a research white paper to a PowerPoint deck. So all of that can become attached to the project itself um, in various different ways. And Laura, I'll give you the opportunity to ask the last question before we wrap up. <laughs> all right, so we caught a glimpse of uh, the dashboard yesterday. Thank you. And I was wondering if you can um, talk about how how it reflects the Lean Startup Canvas and um, yeah, how it ties back to, to that business model canvas associated with Lean Startup. Do you want to answer that? Yeah, sure. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> I'm happy I that you, you saw the dashboard. <laughs> um, <laughs> I just thought since we have our vice president of product, she can maybe answer that. <laughs> uh, so so uh, we showed two dashboards yesterday. So we showed first an engagement dashboard that's at the pipeline level. Um, and then we also showed an innovations dashboard that's at the enterprise level. So I just want to make a quick clarification. So certainly we're not talking about the enterprise level right now because we're, we're looking at the incubate pipeline, right? So enterprise level, very important for reporting for other reasons. Um, but we're not talking about that here. Uh, we're also not really talking about engagement here uh, right now because I don't think I heard Kristen once talk about kind of engaging a, a huge population of people for your incubate process, right? You're looking at dedicated team members with special expertise that can help contribute to those projects. So, but however, there's another dashboard that I didn't show yesterday, um, and that's the the pipeline uh, overall dashboard, and we do do show progression of uh, projects by step. Uh, on that dashboard. I can show you later in the lounge. Um, and that's gonna help you track uh, the progression of those projects through that process over time. And obviously it's dynamic and it reflects uh, the specific process uh, that you've set up for your incubate. We obviously have a default process, but you can actually tweak it if, if you need to make it match uh, your needs. Um, we also show reporting by status as well. So uh, more to show there. Um, happy to, to show anyone who's interested. All right, and there may be other questions and I'm happy to stick around, but I also want to just let people go if they've got some other people to connect with. And thank you so much for coming. Hope this was beneficial and enjoy your day.